Good morning, everybody. This is Laura with Stuff I Find Interesting. And um, you're probably wondering where I've been, right? Like, where's Laura been? Where's Stuff I Find Interesting been? Well, there's been some stuff happening. Um, Good Stuff started a new job, as you know, and it's fabulous. Um, But I went from doing absolutely nothing and day drinking and spending lots of time on the internet and playing video games to walking like 20 miles a week, dealing with kids all day, and running around for like eight hours at a pop. So I've been a little tired. And then I got sick. And then my computer was all messed up. And then also I had to get over myself because I decided that nothing I had to say was interesting and nobody cared. And that I just wasn't going to do this anymore because I'm dumb and stupid. And this is boring. And then... I thought about that some more and I was like, you know what, Laura, it's not your business what other people think of you and it's not your business to make up other people's mind about you. Clearly there are some of you that think this is interesting. So I shall remain here and I shall continue to do interesting things. Now, the stuff I'm doing I haven't looked at in like a month. So it's like stuff I found interesting a month ago. So I'm a little rusty on all of it, but we're going to dive into it. I hope everybody's having a good week. Uh, For those of you that felt the earthquake, yeah, that was pretty weird, right? Uh, And I know people in real life who think that on Monday, tomorrow, that they're going to get raptured along with everybody else in the world. So we live in weird times, people. So this is just leftover stuff from when I did Peru. And those of you that are into like ancient archaeology and rocks and the construction of this stuff and how old is it and who made it, these are some really great pictures to kind of kind of look over because I, I feel like it shows more clearly the construction and it also a lot of the stuff has been maybe knocked down or redone or just doesn't exist anymore, like at all, like you'd never even know it was there. These are all pictures of archaeology from Peru, and they're just, I just find them absolutely amazing. And the reason why this is covered at the top with all that that shrubbery is because this whole thing was was buried and had to be, had to be dug out, possibly, maybe. I don't know. I might be talking out of my ass on that one. I'm not sure. (laughs) I'm sure some of it was buried, but it does look like there was considerable. But then you look around it. I don't know. I don't know that it was buried, this particular one. Look at this beautiful rock thing. Passageway. Detail de un muro formado por bloc de piedra labrada. Let's see how my Spanish is. A detail of a... Partial doorway with blocks on each side. If we look at these blocks too, we see they have like little little nubbies on them. Um, and just to warn everybody up front before I go any further, I'm going to be talking for a while. I got a lot of stuff. So if you're not into listening to people ramble about stuff, this is not this is not going to be for you. You're you're just you're just you're going to be bored and and you're and you're going to be like, wow, this is not for me. So. I just, I love that so much. Just incredible pictures. It will be in the links so you can look at them and peruse them and get as excited about them as I did when I first saw them. Or maybe not get excited. It depends on if rocks are your things thing or not. I am very, very, very much into rocks. So archaeology, rocks, structures... It all kind of dovetails Ain't together. Look, maniacs. look where we are. Do you know Speaking where of Peru. Does it look like ancient Peru? It, it does like look like ancient Peru. From the shores of Lake Titicaca. It does look like something no, from the shores of Lake Titicaca. Central Spain. <gasps> Central Spain. So if you recall, if you go way back in your brain, we've been talking about ancient cultures that existed 
along with ancient cultures that have been presumed to be, at some point in history, Atlantis. Someone has said, oh, that's Atlantis. And so far we've talked about Atlantis in Spain, which is this area. We've talked about Atlantis in Siberia, in that lake, if you remember. And then we talked about Atlantis being in the Eye of Richat, which is in the Sahara Desert. So we've talked about three different places, all with some megalithic stuff going on the Sahara Desert, not so much, unless it's buried. Uh, that's a whole different kind of thing. But it, it, it just goes to show that there's just so much we don't know about the world. And, and there's so many commonalities. And, and I realize, you know, you have a rock, there's only certain so many ways to cut it. And it's the brain, human brain will go, okay, well, if we cut it this way, then we can step up it. And therefore, you'd end up with structures that look the same just by the basis of their function. But I don't know. There's, I think there's more to it than that. I think we were much more connected in the past, that there weren't like small, discrete tribes of people like, you know, they had the Indians over here and like the Eskimos up there and, um, you know, the Aborigines down there, like all separated. I do think there was, there was some crossover and there, are, there probably always has been. But going back to Siberia, there is another place in Siberia that is presumed to be Atlantis. This is the enigmatic city of Por Baijin. This is an overhead view of Por Baijin. What we're looking at are the remains of structures. The early morning mist covers the lake of Terracol on the borders of Russia and Mongolia. The tranquil waters surround an island in the middle of the lake. As the mists recede, the sun's rays fall upon the ruins of a medieval city. Walking between the ancient buildings, you are overcome with nostalgia and intrigue. Who lived here? Where did they go, and why did they abandon this place? The city of Pura Baijin has been known since the 18th century, but large-scale research was not conducted until 2007 and 2008. However, very little is still known about this ancient place. It has been linked to the nomadic Uyghur people due to its location, date, and layout. Specifically, it was once believed that the Uyghur Kagan Moyangchur built the city after his victory over local tribes in 750 A.D., Yet radiocarbon dates suggest the city was built long after his reign. So what was the purpose and function? So it talks a little bit more about the architecture and where did it come from and who built it. Now I did quite some time ago, actually, I did a little write up. When was this? 2021 on Baijin, and this site got completely scrubbed at one point like in 2021 and then it was um using the wayback machine it was it was the archives were brought back so the point i'm getting at is i'm going to share with you this thing that i wrote like a long time ago but it's all messed up because of of it being reformatted but there's some good information in here so it's 1300 years old here we have some uh natives in the area and they're performing a ceremony to bless to bless the spot. Even though tribal systems are described here as first emerging in the past, some contemporary cultures continue to exhibit many of these cultural traits while simultaneously taking an active part in the global system. For example, when the ruins of an ancient settlement called Por Baijin in southern Siberia were to be excavated, shamans from the local contemporary Tuval tribes performed a blessing ritual asking the gods permission to dig. Locals were reluctant to work at the site before the ritual. So there were people in the area, archaeologists came in, we want permission to get to the area. They said, no, not until we perform the ceremony. They performed the ceremony. This is what it would have looked like in its heyday with each one of these buildings being a full, a full structure, not like a dollhouse size structure, but you know, like a whole like house. Here's a tile and a, it looks like a, a, a finial from a roof column. You can see how fancy it is. This isn't just a bunch of blocks thrown together. This is what it looks like if you zoom out. At the time that it was built, it is believed that the lake was had more land exposed. So this talks about the legend. And 
and it is um, let me see if there's any new information in here that I haven't shared already mm. so interestingly and this is the part that I found the most interesting is that Putin when this place was found immediately like rushed there like dropped everything and went to southern Siberia to look at this place and he also brought his Russian minister for emergencies why would I, I just find that str very striking I mean yes it's 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 incredible thing but I don't know it just seems odd to me now if you wanted to go there <laughs> This is the guy who, who works as a guide in the Tuval community. He's so cute, isn't he? I found this from his website. Here's his little cat. He's on his boat. He lives on another island in Lake Terracol with his aide, Romeo, dog Strelka, and cat Kiska. Between helping visitors, he fishes for pike. Here we have some more pictures. We have some people traipsing about on it. It looks like someone built these rather big and complicated faculties then abandoned them, not living here at all. It was built gradually, not at once. Cracks appeared in the walls during construction, but they were repaired. The main question is, who built this and why was it abandoned? The first theory is that it was a summer palace, but if it is located in the remote taiga, so military and administrative management would be difficult from here. It could have been the summer palace built for a Ka Khan's wife, possibly the spouse or intended partner of Biugu Kagan, son of Boyan Chor. So it's saying maybe it's it was for a mistress. And what is this? That's really kind of it. Uh, here's just a, a bunch of links. This will this link will be in the links. But Atlantis, probably not. This is completely random. And this is when I was looking up the uh, the Russian, the Cossack sword dancing thing. And I didn't find the website so interesting as I found the comments in the in on here. Because the comments, it's from someone who, who is a Cossack. And he talks about his experience. It says, um, I'm trying to find the part where he talks about, um, see, I haven't looked at this in a month, so now I'm like, um, I'm fading out. So there are more stuff in here but I am writing simply writing to relate an interesting and true story to you I am of Don and Siberian Cossack heritage I am proud of my heritage and have learned a lot about it I was taught how to correctly wield a shashka and am very skilled with one my family has resided in Australia now since the late 1940s as many Cossacks were purged during the revolution in this case my story is about my father's godfather Dajia Mitya he died in 94, but was born in 1896. The thing I find interesting is that this person pops up in this random sword page and talks about kind of his, his life in it and the, in the family, the family history and where he comes from and the, the swords and how they're made. And, uh, he really kind of goes on for a bit, but it's, it's an interesting thing to look at flood my squidno suggesting that it was actively her job to so keep the water at bay. this is the mystery Rose of the kingdom that sank into the ocean he does is look at and this is another candidate for Atlantis and I know you're like oh my god I swear we're not gonna talk about Atlantis anymore after this I'm, I'm freaking done I'm done with Atlantis <laughs> so in the Bodleian Library in Oxford there's a map a very old map and there's two mysterious islands off the coast of Ceredigion in Wales. I think I said that wrong. But what made the islands stand out on this map is that they no longer exist. There are no islands there. So were the maps wrong? Were there actually two islands there? Let's talk a little bit about this mystery. A 13th, 14th century map held in the Bodleian Library 
shows two lost islands in Cardigan Bay offshore West Wales, United Kingdom. This study investigates historical sources alongside geological and bathymetric evidence and proposes a model of post-glacial coastal evolution that provides an explanation for the lost islands and a hypothetical framework for future research. During the Pleistocene, Irish Sea ice occupied the area from the north and from the west and Welsh ice from the east. A landscape of unconsolidated Pleistocene deposits developed seaward of a pre of a relict pre quaternary cliff line with a land surface up to 30 meters above present sea level level. So it's it goes into how how it existed. This is the academic article. And if you click on this, it does give you the article that you can read it. So this is the, the academics of it. And it's also in Apparently, there's some French here, too. So if you're in French, une carte de 13th et 14th siècle que détient la bibliothèque. I just love saying bibliothèque. So, so here's the variation. The land was lost to floods when a well made in name Merited. Mer, mer, merid. Merid? allowed the well to overflow. So there's this maiden, her name was Merid. She was the well maiden, and she allowed the well to overflow, and it destroyed these two islands, which may or may not have been Atlantis. Scythonin, one of two princes responsible for the sea defenses, got drunk one night, resulting in the sea overrunning def the defenses and flooding the kingdom. That's another myth. <laughs> so we have a guy who got drunk or a maiden that forgot to mind the well. So what, what actually happened? But there is a book called The Black Book of Carmarthen that has some information about these two lost islands. And it's further supported records by records by the Roman cartographer Ptolemy that suggested the coastline was much further west than it is today. And it would be much further west because of these islands, which actually might not have been islands at the time. They may have, they may have get, been connected. This, these are some remnants of that island. Is that really all I saved for that? I guess that's it. There you have it. Two islands off the coast of Wales. May or may not be Atlantis. <laughs> News at 11. On to the next one. I'm too funny. We're moving on to architecture because that's what I have on my list. Sometimes I go back to my list and I look at what I found interesting or the way I put it together and I'm like, what? Like, why? When? Um, but the reality is I, I do this very much off the cuff. So I guess it's like kind of like baking a souffle without looking at the recipe. It might come out a little different every time. This is Louis Berrigan, one of my favorite architects. Don't know that I would want to live in his houses or structures, but I find them very, very interesting. And he says, I think that the ideal space must contain elements of magic, serenity, sorcery, and mystery. It is essential to an architect to know how to see. I mean, to see in such a way that the ver vision is not overpowered by rational analysis. Architecture is an art when one consciously or unconsciously creates an aesthetic emotion in the atmosphere and when this environment produces well-being. So this concept doesn't exist really for us pores, and that is environment as a way, uh, environment existing as a way to enhance mental well-being. So everything around you is, is done so that as you look at it, you feel better. You go, oh, I feel nice. I feel good. I feel good. And we're not seeing that. The buildings that I'm seeing going up right now, they look like buildings from like USSR. They're like concrete blocks. And they put on these fake like wooden flourishes to make it look like it might have a sort of turret or like Dutch sort of thing going on. But it's all fake. Casa Gilardi. Very purple and pink. This is a Mexico City. This is a commission that he took. And... Berrigan accepted the job offer 
Berrigan accepted the job, two conditions attracted by the project. The huge jacaranda tree that should be kept in the sun and the pool requested by the owner as part of the program. So this is a terrible translation, but the owner said, I want you to make me a house in your style. You do such a great job, but the huge jacaranda tree needs to be left alone and I need to have room for my pool. And this is the pool, I guess. It's a little creepy. <laughs> I love the yellow with the blue. This is the doorway. Chapel, oh, this is a different building. Chapel of the Cappuccinas. It's entrancing spaces, though. The outside, uh, I'm not jazzed about the outside, but I kind of like the fact that the outside looks a certain way, and then when you go in, it sort of defies expectations and is way more light-filled and interesting than you would think, which I guess would be the mystery part. I think that's a door. I don't like stairs that don't have a railing. I'm a very, very clumsy person, and I need to have railings. <laughs> even when I was working out, like, I don't even know, four or five hours a day, and I was, like, in peak athletic form and dancing at the same time, I could not go upstairs like these unaided. Fifteen projects that he, Louis Berrigan has done. We have the Casa de Berrigan. These are just more pictures of his architecture because I like it so much. It's just eye candy. It's very, very interesting. This is... This is like something out of a dream, I swear. That's the pool. There's the architect hiding behind the wall. I love that picture. This is the jacaranda tree that needed to be, um, needed to have sunlight and be built around so that it was protected. Casa de Cristo. Those are not stairs. Look at that. I really like his stuff a lot. I'm not even remotely architectural. I couldn't begin to design a building. I couldn't tell you how to make it stay up. But my eye knows what my eye likes. I guess he likes the color pink. A lot of his stuff is, is very pink. Hmm. I do like the color pink, but I don't know if I like that whole place is pink. This is a garden. And I think that's it. Yeah. Okay. Come with me. We're moving on. There is no trace of gra above ground today of the elaborate, extensive grid pattern ruin of this, the Celtic-like village that was once situated on Bluff Point above Cuca Lake. The ruin is on Skyline Drive, about four miles south of Cuca Park, New York, which is off of Route 54A. On Yates County Highway map, Cuca Park is marked site of primitive mound Indians. There are two mounds on Skyline Drive, one quite close to the ruin site and directly north of it. Detailed reports of the ruin come principally from only three sources that I can find. The results of a geological survey, the results of an excavation of the site, and a brief report from 1954. So this is interesting to me because I've never heard about it. I did not know that there were um, mysterious mounds in New York. I mean, not, not that, that it's surprising like you would expect there to be. Um, yeah. But I have not heard of this. What was I getting at with this, though? I think I had a point, like an overall arching point. I'm going to sit here for a minute and think about what that point might be. <laughs> I got nothing. 
They found bedrock quarry to a depth of 10 feet. Arches were of sandstone, the bases of which were set into the cut bedrock. Stones engraved with human and animal heads, along with iron objects and similar ornamentation. One iron object with granular ornamentation and another with a red enamel design. Broken metal platter, metal detector indicated the presence of stoneware, including hammers, pounders, polishers, mortars, and pestles, and fragments of a seal. Among the images of, he- of humans, that a woman was the most frequent and that it seemed to be similar to those that were of Nordic origin. So there's walls and mounds and like a whole, like evidence of a whole civilization at this, in this area, which is, I guess, in the Finger Lakes. And it was probably the Hopewell people. But I, I think, I think my, my point in this, finding this and sharing this with you is, is that like, I often talk about when I was in school, but it's true. When I was in school, we talked about Indians, right? And Indians were like, ooh, 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 ooh. you know, they wore loincloths, lived in like primitive teepees, and like that was it. That was that was what Indians were. Some were w- more warlike, some were less warlike, some, you know, there were variations, but they were all centered around the same theme, which were natives, primitive, white man, not primitive. And I think that when we find things like this, it shows that, the, that that's not the case and that there is no necessarily primitive or non-primitive. There's just primitive and non-primitive right now. Like I would argue that the United States, if we keep going the way we're going, we will end up on a more primitive path. If we look at the Middle East, Middle East, some areas much more primitive, uh, lack of running water, lack of electricity, living in simple structures, uh, living off the land, being self-sufficient. I'm just saying. But this points to a society, a whole kind of civilization that we don't, that we're not really talking about. And it, and it, and it, the guy who did the archaeology is saying, this is like Nordic architecture. So, ancient jobs from hell. We may rely on regular sessions of retail therapy or an all unfaltering Protestant work ethic to get us through the daily drudgery of our working lives. But we have at least come a long way from antiquity. Had you and I been born in any other period of history, we'd have learned this the hard way through a presumably daily dose of blood, sweat, and tears. This article details an assortment of ancient jobs that make being a call center worker, tax collector, or the ethics advisor for Boris Johnson, I'm assuming this was written a while ago, seem like a walk in the park. So we have a progustator. This is someone who tastes food. For the king or someone of importance who thinks that they might be poisoned, they say, here, eat my food first. Poisoning had become a scourge of society in the Roman Empire. People resorted to poison for any number of reasons, from removing political enemies to ensuring an inheritance to getting rid of a pesky family member. Our sources suggest that poisoning was a big problem in the imperial palace, but it probably also plagued the minds of cheating husbands and rough traders and households throughout Rome and its empire. So the upside is that, you know, if you were like a, basically a poor person hanging out at the palace, you get to hang out at the palace and you get to eat some really good food. The downside is you could die. What makes the job of imperial poison taster even more bizarre is that at least under the reign of Nero, there was also an imperial poisoner. Along with his mother Agrippina, Nero employed the services of the skilled poisoner Locusta to get rid of their enemies. I don't know, that's not so weird. We have a name caller. And this person, what do they do? So they just walked around and everybody they saw, they just said their name really loud. (laughs) That's what they did. John Smith. Gene Adams. Interesting. Rower. We know a rower. You have the ship, you know, lined up with benches and men rowing. That would be a tough job. Prostitute. We know what a prostitute does. Urinary tax collector. Urine used to be a hot commodity, and urine used to be a hot commodity because urine contains a little bit of phosphorus, and phosphorus can be used for things like making weapons. 
It could also be used to soaking animal skins before tanning, to extracting the ammonia to clean clothes, and it was also used as toothpaste. A vestal virgin, someone who was a professional um, virgin. Oh, no, wait, maybe not. Hang on. The vestal convicted of incest. I have no, I'm missing something here. Is buried alive in the neighborhood of the Porta Colina under the agar of Servius Tullius. Here is a crypt, small inside, through which a ladder is low, a small opening through which a ladder is lowered. It is refurnished with a bed, an oil lamp, and a few scanty provisions. And then they close up the passage and they leave the person to die. That's it. Oh, so this, I guess this is a punishment that they used to do. I don't know what that has to do. Minor armpit hair plucker. So. I guess there was someone who would, you go to the beauty salon and they would pluck your hair. Boxer. This article is really stupid. I'm sorry, guys. I thought this would be more interesting. But it's not. Alexander Mennings, your article is dumb. Shawnee Forrest discovers oldest banded bat in its history. This is a really cool story. During a bat survey to identify and count the wildlife, a Shawnee National Forest wildlife biologist ran into an old acquaintance, a bat the forest banded over 15 years ago. The adult male Indiana bat was captured and banded on October 5, 2009 at a cave entrance in Pope County, then recited and photographed February 15, 2024 at the same cave, but outside during a winter bat hibernacula survey. This is the oldest known bat in the forest since bat survey started in the 1990s, it's also significant because the bat was banded before white nose syndrome was documented here. So here's the little bat. You see his little nose. 15-year-old bat. I didn't know they lived that long. Let's see. How long do bats live? 16? Apparently they can live up to 30 years. So I have a problem with this light here. So if you see like weird stuff going, maybe we can make it. No, that's not what I wanted. Maybe we do that. <laughs> no, that's not, not at all what I was going for. Okay. I have a filter with like a light behind it and the filter has decided that it doesn't want to be upright anymore. So it's like falling down and it's messing me up. Now, imagining you're walking along the lake, picking up shells or whatever, and you see this thing, and you're like, what the heck is that? What is that? Let's look at some more pictures. Oops. Oh. <laughs> uh... See, and reasons like this why I go, you know what? I should not be doing this. Is this? Mm. Yes, yeah, so these are artifacts that were found in this lake next to that structure that I just showed you. I just messed this all up. Let's go back. Where the heck was I? Let me show you. No, I think I have other pictures. Okay, that was terrible. <laughs> Get it together, Lord. Get it together. Okay, so what are we talking about here? I'm talking about uh, Caligula's palace barge that was on Lake Nemi. The Nemi ships. The Nemi ships were two ships of different sizes built under the reign of the Roman Emperor Caligula in the first century AD on Lake Nemi. Although the purpose of the ships is speculated upon, the larger ship was an elaborate floating palace which contained quantities of marble, mosaic floors, heating and plumbing, and amenities such as baths. Both ships feature technology thought to have been developed historically later. It has been stated the emperor was influenced by the lavish lifestyles of the Hellenistic rulers of the Syracuse and Ptolemaic Egypt. Recovered from the lake bed in 1929, the ships were destroyed by fire in 1944. 
So this is Lake Nemi. And he built a bunch of ships, two ships to just kind of hang out on the lake and float around. So he was into Egypt stuff. He was into the ISIS cult. So the, the, the barge would have been decorated elaborately with Egyptian type motifs. Local fishermen had long been aware of the existence of the wrecks. This is before they were completely like unearthed and had explored them and removed small artifacts, often using grappling hooks to pull up pieces, which they sold to tourists. But then what happened is Mussolini was like, yeah, those ships, they're, they're like, they're, you know, they're historic. They should be celebrated we should be talking about them more you know they belong to italy it's you know the italian history so he literally drained the entire lake to get to these barges let me get to that part Um, before i get to that part both ships had bilge pumps it crank handles piston pumps, ball bearings, uh, some ball bearings that were lenticular in shape and some ball bearings that were cylindrical in shape. They think that some of these ball bearings may have been used for displaying statues. The statues might have maybe moved around. So Project Diana was, in 1995, was a project to... Um, recreate the Nemi ships and have a museum and get as many artifacts together as they could, you know, buying some that were, you know, already on the black market and doing some more archaeology and celebrating this wonderful thing. This, let's see. This talks about some of the, um, a little bit more about the technology. So when Archaeologists really looked into these ships. They were like, this ship has piston pumps. Piston pumps weren't invented until blah, 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 blah. How can this be? And this is just another situation of many where we discover something that pushes the needle back. There's always more to the story. It always goes further back. Look, there's the hand, the hand thingy just laying there. It's incredible. Here's a mosaic. Statues. Just absolutely incredible. And it's unfortunate that some of these pictures you can't, you can't see. If you go back to the Wayback Archive, you can see a couple more of them, but by and large, you can't see them anymore. I'm not sure why that is. Oh, I see why, because you need permission. Fair enough. This is a picture of what it might have looked like. I say might because it's all speculative. Here's some of the ball bearings. Very exciting stuff. It actually is pretty exciting because it shows, you know, advanced knowledge of engineering and how things go together. So there's this woman who went to a, a, a book signing. There was an Italian expert that was doing a, a, a book about ancient and modern art pieces that utilize the reddish purple stone that the book is named after, which is porphyry. Anyway, it was about rocks. He did this book on rocks. This woman who loves rocks went to this book signing. There was a lady with a young guy with a strange hat that came to the table and he said, oh, Helen, look, that's your mosaic in this picture. And she said, yes, that's my mosaic. And they get to talking and come to find out is that the mosaic was part of an inlaid floor on one of the party ships commissioned by Caligula prior to his assassination. In the 1930s, Italian dictator Benito Mussolini ordered Lake Nemi to be drained so the party ships and artifacts they contained could be recovered and housed in the Lakeside Museum. The lack of fire damage to the mosaics suggests the mosaic was either snuck out prior to the fire or was in a private collection following its extraction from Lake Nemi. 
So she turned it over. She was like, oh, okay, well, apparently this isn't just a, a, a reproduction. This is actually the mosaic that was on the ship. And De Buffalo says he sympathizes with Fiorati's loss of her coffee table and offered to make her a replica. I really would do a copy for her, exact copy. She would not be able to tell the difference. So they, they, they took it. It doesn't look like she really got, she got paid for it. Here are some photos of some of the artifacts, which are really quite, quite extraordinary. The coins. Lots and lots and lots of coins. Uh, that's something else entirely, but this gentleman has a lot, a lot of incredible photos. Joe Geranio. If you're into numismatics, looks like this is your guy. Well, numismatics from that particular area. Pioneering world-class science missions for Earth. Completely random thing I found, and I went, hmm. These are all of the scientific satellites that are out there. We have an environmental satellite, gravity mission, soil mo moisture and ocean salinity, ice mission, magnetic field mission, atmospheric dynamics mission, earth cloud aerosol and radiation explorer, biomass and flex which is the fluorescence explorer which i've not heard of so let's click on that about the mission the fluorescence imaging spectrometer instrument is specifically designed to measure vegetation fluorescence within the spectral range of 500 nm to 780 nm it helps scientists to gain a deeper understanding of photosynthetic activity in plant health it's kind of cool to know that this stuff is, is going on, right? It gives you a little bit of hope for, for stuff because you're like, wow, okay. Well, if we're making these things, maybe, maybe, we, maybe we have a chance where we can flip it around and we can look at it. So this thing was created in a lab, one of those labs where everybody wears big body suits and booties and stuff, and then it was launched into space, and now it measures the fluorescence of our trees and plants. Moving on. Look at this beautiful place. This is Taiwan's forgotten island, Kinmen, Kinmen Island. And it's only six miles from China. And we can see it's, it's incredible looking. We don't want to see this guy's face, sorry. <laughs> we don't want to see. Okay, there we go. So this is entertaining to watch, not necessarily to like talk about because there's not really much to say because he's saying it all, but it's really extraordinary looking place. Just incredible. Like everything about it, it looks really cool. Here's some more pictures, some static pictures. I would not mind going there at all. That looks like a neat place to be. Look at the tile work in this courtyard. In certain cultures, it was considered like, um, I don't want to say normal, I don't know what the word is, but the architecture was built around a courtyard, like that was part of the building footprint. And that was part of Shanhu folk culture, were these courtyards. Where I live, I actually have a courtyard, and the courtyard is actually probably 50% of the reason why, why I'm here, even though it's not well-maintained or particularly aesthetically pleasing. I just really like it. So this is the little, this is the folk village. It's kind of neat. There's 129,000 residents. And there's some nervousness about the islands because the islands, um, 
they want to have closer commercial chi- t- uh, ties with China so they can they can get water, electricity, internet. Um, it's easier for them to go to China and get what they need than to go to Taiwan. So there's some nervousness that this particular that this island is going to be subsumed subsumed by by China. That's the fear. China, on the other hand, sees this island as this has always been part of our our world, part of China, and they split off, but they should not have split off, and we're going to get it back kind of thing. I said that very poorly, but, but you know what I mean. This is a hall that is built in a cavern on Kinmen Island. Kinmen means golden door or golden gate. A small archipelago of several islands administered by Taiwan and located near Xiamen, China, no more than two kilometers away. Oh, part one of the islands is only 1.2 miles away. The main island we looked at was five. The island was the site of extensive shelling between communist and national forces during the first and second Taiwan Straits crisis. The hall was built as a shelter for military commanders to safely give instructions during the war. Here we have remnants of barricades. Here's a less romantic picture of the village. This is Xiu or Lion Inlet, part of Kinmen County, one of Taiwan's offshore islands, seen in front of Xiamen, China. So this is China. This is Taiwan. That's an interesting juxtaposition. A deserted wall of speakers that was used for anti-China propaganda. A woman in her kitchen. These are... So this guy makes knives out of recovered artillery shells. There's certain poetry in that. A very intriguing place to be sure and one that I was not aware of until I came across the article and I was like hey so we're uh we're Kinmen Island out let's forge forward to the Agoregi Forge and Mills so just like there was a Silk Road through like the, the Middle East and then across you know Mm, like Indian stuff. Um, there was also what was known as an iron road in the Pyrenees. And the iron road was where iron was made. It was produced and then brought brought to other places. These are just pictures. I'll probably talk more about it in the future. But right now I just wanted to look at some of the some of the pictures because I think it's just a beautiful, beautiful location. Look at that. Those are some of the old tools. This is a museum. This is a picture I had as my screensaver for a while. I find this land very pleasing to the eye. I like it a lot. Someone like sneezed, I think, when they took that picture. At you. <laughs> this is the Iron Road in the Pyrenees. So the iron would have been made and then it probably would have been brought by ship this way or maybe that way. At any rate, that's where a lot of the a lot of the iron came from. Okay. We are I was going to say we're coming to the end, but apparently I got really I got really ambitious. You can hear I'm starting to fade out and I have all this stuff to talk about. Like what the hell was I thinking? <laughs> what was I thinking? The Pyrenees from 1280 to 1850. They are 3,404 meters above sea level. This height is modest compared to other mountains on the planet. However, they have a great history that links man with the mountains. The Pyrenees were the first mountains that man faced. The legend says that Roldan, a knight of the Carlo Magno in the Middle Ages, was persecuted in France, so he fled. In Marbury, seeing that the mountains blocked the road, he used his sword, Durandal, to make a huge cut in the mountain, now called Rolden Gap. 
Pedro III, king of Catalonia and Aragon, in the year 1285, proposed to climb Canigo, considered the highest mountain in the Pyrenees. When he arrived at the summit, he imagined seeing a lake and a dragon, perhaps due to his exhaustion. At this time, there were numerous legends about the mountain, as well as religious stories that gave rise to hermitages, such as the Circus of Estabe and the Mary of Nuria. The scientists of Henry Raybould in 1787 ascended the first summit more than 3,000 meters, the summit of the Torrent de Nouvelle-Vielle. And then he climbed, the next year, he climbed the other mountain, Quarat. In 1796, Raymond sought to sought a route to ascend Mount Perdido, which was 3,355 meters. He went to the Tokoroi Gap with nine companions, discovered the largest glacier in the Pyrenees, the north face of the Mont Perdido, and the frozen lake of Marbore. The lost mount was reached in 1802 by the guides Laurent and Rondo, hired by Raymond and accompanied by an Aragonese shepherd. There's probably like a whole book in here that would be like way more interesting if it was like I'm just reading absolutely, I'm just like reading snippets. In 1822, this guy was like, I'm going to climb this mountain too, and I'm going to do it without ropes. His body wasn't found until 107 years later. 1848, the first female ascent happened. And in 1849, the French scientists made several measurements in the Eastern Pyrenees, ascending to the main summit. So this is all about rock climbing and summiting. And there's like little things here so we can read. You can read more about it. You know, sort of about its, its history and the people who climbed it and things like that. It's interesting. If you're interested in that sort of thing. Now there's a dog that comes from here called the Pyrenees. And they were known as, uh, they evolved from a group of principally white mountain flock guard dogs that originated 10 or 11,000 years ago in Asia Minor. It is very plausible that these large white dogs arrived in the early Pyrenees Mountains with their shepherds and domestic sheep, sheep about 3000 BC. There they encountered the indigenous people of the area, one of which were the Basques, descendants of Cro-Magnon men. In the isolation of the Pyrenees Mountains over these millenniums, the breed developed the characteristics that make it unique to the group of flock guardian dogs in general and the primarily white members of that group. So these are extraordinary dogs from what I understand, but they have a lot of energy. I think I just like this picture. I'm not sure what I was getting at. Did Hannibal and his troops pass through the Pyrenees? Now, if you remember in the Pyrenees, it is said that Hannibal went over the Pyrenees on elephants. So, you know, did that actually happen? This has some discussion about the archaeology of that area and the, and the findings. And it doesn't really come to any conclusions. 